we weren't really sure if we were going to sort of get through this but I think we're a pretty resilient bunch hospitality people I think you know every service is a crisis period at times and uh, we're able to um, react and and uh, be responsive and and maintain positivity in the in the darkest hours you know this is the deep in the weeds podcast I'm Anthony Huckstep Brisbane was often overshadowed by siblings Melbourne and Sydney in regards to dining out in Australia. But over the last five years, it has been the most exciting dining hub down under. A wave of new restaurants joined the throng of great operators to add colour, character and nuance to the Australian culinary landscape. For a big city experiencing a real food awakening, what sort of impact have the restrictions had? Ben O'Donoghue is one of Australia's most loved chefs, and he's the co-owner of Billy Cart Kitchen, Billy Cart West End, and Bender's Bar. Ben, how are you, mate? It's been a while. Yeah, it has, Hux. I think the last time I saw you was up in uh, Port Douglas. Would have been oh, a few geez. years ago now. I don't know if I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably for uh, reasons we can't mention. <laughs> yes, <indeed. laughs> lots of alcohol consumed and blurred the blurred the lines. Yeah, I, I, I dare say so, um, mate. It's um, a bit of a different world to back then. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of things today, but can you give us a picture of sort of what happened early days when the pandemic hit and the impact that it had on you? And you know, you've got multiple businesses. Wow, it's um, you know, it's kind of weird. Um, you saw it coming, but you didn't really think that. It had have the impact that it had. I was, you know, just before it all happened in sort of January, February, March, early March, I was sort of like working down in Melbourne. I just started filming a new show, um, My Market Kitchen. And, um, you know, so I was away for four days, five days, fly back, work the weekend and repeat, repeat, repeat until sort of the middle of March. And, and, and we just saw things, you know, as the, um, you know, the, the, the virus was in the media and people's sort of uh, uh, attitudes and actions were changing, you know, the panic buying, we're working in the Pran market, the Pran markets and you could just see this frenzy, suddenly the butchers are getting really busy and um, you know, the bakery guy next door to us sold out of his bread every day and previously to that, he, you know, he always had bread left. One of the egg guy there sold 500 dozen eggs in two days i mean like this whole week's fucking stock just went so it was phenomenal from that point of view to see that kind of like real kind of ill ease and panic buying and um you know from a business point of view we could see it affecting us you know all of a sudden they were putting restrictions on us the number of diners you could have in was reduced you had to have the spacings and stuff so we were getting quieter thinking oh what's going to happen here and next door i've got a butcher and Every day he was just getting truckloads of meat coming in and he was getting busier. He was working seven days and we're just like, this is so weird, you know. Um, and then it w- the call was made and you had to shut down and, um, well, you know, just sort of like panic sort of set in, you know, what do you do, what do you do? And we, luckily for for one of my businesses, Billy Cart Kitchen Annerley, we're a sort of like a small, re- uh, like a suburban cafe restaurant and... Um, Everyone was at home, so we thought, okay, we're going to we, we're staying open. We're going to switch to takeaway straight away, and um, our, and um, you know our, we obviously couldn't do dinner, so we start. We thought, well, our concept here is that we do um, an internationally inspired menu every Friday night, dine in. We're just going to flip that and turn it into a takeaway concept. We'll do one meal, uh, main course, supplemented by dessert and a couple of sides. Uh, maybe a, an add-on, I mean, and um, bang, it just went off. We were doing like 250 um, meals over two days. So it was like no no um, delivery, it was just solely pick up. You came in between one and three and, um, you know, we were just flat out. And <laughs> the stress levels of that. Did that response surprise you? Um, yeah, actually, um, yeah, it did, you know. Um, We've always really been heavily supported by our locals. You know, um, we're very well connected with our community here. We've been here for seven years. You know, my wife's got a wonderful relationship with all of our customers. And, um, you know, um, and as do I, she has more contact because I'm normally sort of in the kitchen slaving away. Um, But, you know, there was an immense amount of support 
and really good feedback on on the takeaway sort of stuff and and that really kind of un, underpinned us although we saw you know, a massive drop in our actual turnover over 30 percent um um but you know it gave, it gave us sort of real fortitude and knowing that those people were there for us and of course coffee sales go through the roof that's one thing that uh you know is essential i think <laughs> people can go without food but they don't seem to be going without coffee uh the other restaurant uh west end which is a bigger restaurant you know with 120 people more staff it, we just kind of like shut that down and uh sort of had a moment to think about it and then uh, again reverted to a limited takeaway heat and eat sort of concept we had our churrasco so we're doing sort of family roast packs off that um, and at the same time, um, because a lot of our sort of client, uh, percentage of our clientele are those sort of um, frontline workers, we're close to the two hospitals at West End, so we decided to um, um, do meals to keep our to keep our staff busy, to keep them occupied. Is okay, we'll we'll donate and give food to um, those frontline services because they had everything around them shut. There was no cafes, nothing in the hospital, so. They were going to work, working long hours and um, not being able to get any food. So that's what we did. Although we got a little bit of stick from that because obviously, you know, some people were saying, well, they've got jobs. Uh, and a lot of our sort of um, brethren in the industry didn't. But, you know, that was just the way we reacted and what we what we thought was right to do. How have you felt through this period? You know, as you're saying, you've, you've built up the businesses over seven years and you've got a long history in the hospitality sector, which I'd love to talk about in a little while. But... You know, how have you, how have you felt and, you know, what's your thoughts about the future of your establishment? Well, you know, we were certainly going into a new paradigm. Um, I don't think our industry's, you know, I, well, it's never going to be the same again. There's so much of it's going to change. Um, you know, I, I, we went through an emotional roller coaster. you know, the stresses of trying to adapt to this new takeaway kind of concept, um, keeping counts of um, portions and, and serves that, you know, we needed to produce and cause some friction between me and my wife. Uh, she'd kicked in a number of doors <laughs> in frustration with me, um, uh, you know, maybe sort of freaking out about numbers that they've sold and double checking, triple checking. Um, so we've been through, you know, an emotional roller coaster. It's uh, even now reopening, uh, you know, gives me anxiety, gives my wife an anxiety because, um, you know, this there's so much we have to um, deal with in terms of new regulations and managing staff needs and hours and you know um, and we we weren't really sure if we were going to sort of get through this initially um, and uh, but you know I think we're a pretty resilient bunch hospitality people I think you know every service is a crisis period at times and uh, we um, we're able to um, react and, and uh, be responsive and, and maintain positivity in the, in the darkest hours, you know. Um, and um, that kind of uh, fortitude has sort of got us through. And, um, you know, we've got some good staff as well that have been pretty flexible. Um, but uh, I think, you know, like they say in Game of Thrones, winter is definitely coming. I think it's, it's the next three, three or four months going to be the real litmus test now once they start reducing or pulling back job keeper. It's going to be really difficult. Um, I don't know. Because um, now people are starting to open up. We've seen a, a pullback in um, uh, the takeaways and stuff and people are now wanting to sit down a little bit. So we've reverted to um, a private dining sort of uh, experience just for 10 people on Friday, Saturday nights here at Annerley. Uh, we've opened up at West End for dinners, again limited, but um, it's not enough revenue to sort of really sort of, um, you know, pay all the bills. And without JobKeeper, I think we'd, we'd definitely, well, West End would definitely be in trouble. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it def definitely, um, it's a big two fingers to uh, to the industry, you know, this COVID, because it's, it's really emphasised the... Um, inequities in our industry um, in terms of, uh, you know, how we make money. Um, our costs are way too high. Um, a lot of my friends in the industry are actually now saying to me, um, uh, we're actually making money, you know, um, with JobKeeper. Um, you know, the, although the turnover's down, the actual profits are up because you've taken out massive amounts of your expenses. I've got a friend that's got a wage cost now of 5%. Um, you know, he's busy. Um, 
he's not paying any rent and he's actually making money. Before that, you know, your, your wage costs are running at 45%. Um, you know, if, it, if turnover slips in a particular week, it might run, push to 50 and you just, you can't operate like that, you know. So things need to change in that respect and how, how that happens, I, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> How has it been trying to make decisions, you know, with the restrictions changing all the time and how confusing they are? Like in Queensland at the moment, restaurants and cafes can have 10 people with the four square metre rule, but places in the outback can have 20 as long as they have an ID and they're a local resident. Um, it, you know, there's just so many different uh, restrictions. You know, is it, has it been difficult to decide, you know, what you want to do moving forward? Um. Not now. I think, you know, we're fairly resolute in what we're going to do. People say you got to open or have been saying. We're like, no, no, we're going to wait. We're going to get ourselves organised. I think it was harder in the, uh, in the beginning of it all where it was the great unknown. Um, making decisions then, you were kind of just kind of second guessing. It's become a lot easier um, to make those decisions. But um, it's getting organised and putting all those um, sort of processes in place. I mean... Now it's it's not so much the numbers; it's the um, it's the bu- bureaucracy that's uh, involved in actually opening. You know, getting everyone's contact details. So, you know, when we take bookings of ten, we ha- we get them to email all names, phone numbers, email addresses. You know, so uh, and we're effectively doing the government's job for them. You know, it's uh, like pe- we have to get people trained in COVID um, sort of uh, um, tr- health and safety training. Although that's provided free, it's all time and an and extra effort, which is, uh, you know, frustrating. But um, I, I think, you know, the, the thing, compare the country to, um, to here, I mean, it's about population density, isn't it? I mean, um, you might be in the, the you know, it's, um, yeah, I think uh, I, I don't really sort of, um, you know, I don't have any real gripe about that. It's just it is what it is, so we just have to deal with it. You've uh, had a really long and interesting career as a chef and also, you know, made multiple television shows as well to celebrate uh, food in, in Australia and the UK. Um, what, why did you become a chef? <laughs> but, <laughs> it's funny, you asked, you asked uh, Colin this question, he goes, because I couldn't read and write. And uh, it's, um, <laughs> it's probably similar for me. I mean, I, I'd made a complete clusterfuck of my year 12 um, I really didn't spend any time uh, studying. Uh, you know, I was surfing and punching cones uh, for most of my study back period. Um, and uh, surprise, surprise, I really didn't get the marks that I needed to go into, uh, into college. And I wanted to be a teacher. So um, I ended up uh, working on an island off WA and uh, fell into the kitchen. I'd always worked in sort of like, uh, not hospitality, but fast food as kitchen hands, you know, uh, red rooster, that sort of stuff. You're taking chickens off spits, um, slinging burgers. So, and my family, my grandmother was always uh, a really great cook. So I'd always kind of been involved in sort of catering or cuisine in some regard. But I ended up getting a job on an island in the kitchen, and um, you know, um, I was just thrown into it and um, really loved it. And found that um, you know I was stimulated by it. I loved the in- instantaneousness of of cooking and creating and um, and, um, you know, uh, and, and it was something that I, I sort of seemed to be good at. So I pursued it. And then, it, you know, fortuitously, um, I, I made a series of good decisions, I think. I was mentored by some wonderful people um, during my um, apprenticeships and uh, earlier years and um, gave me drive. And, um, yeah, I've, I've never really looked back. So, yeah, in, in short, I, I, I sort of fucked up my future and became a chef. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you said you fell into a kitchen, but, you know, you ended up working at places like the River Cafe and with Jamie Oliver at Monty's Club and, like, some pretty amazing uh, restaurants and times. You know, what was it like in that period? Um, I, you know, it's probably, for me, as a professional, it's sort of like some of the greatest moments were when I worked in the UK, um, obviously working in a place like the River Cafe, which is... Uh, well, so um, egalitarian. Everyone was on the same footing by the sort of head chef or the, the, you know, the owners. Obviously, everyone was a chef to party, and it was like very competitive. Um, you always wanted to be 
better at the job that you were doing than the person that was on that section before you or, um, you know, so uh, it really was, um, you had to be self-motivated there and the ingredients that we worked with were fantastic, um, you know, the clientele were amazing, um, just, you know, it's A-list people every day kind of coming in, so it was a real kind of like... Um, stimulating place to work uh and then obviously the people that you worked with like you know darren simpson jamie oliver uh theo randall um you know the list goes on hugh fertile whittingston they were all in the team when i you know just prior or just when i started so it was you know it was it was fantastic and great repartee between all the all the people while we were working you know it's great you know um and then I you know, worked in other restaurants, like Atlantic Bar and Grill, which is a massive operation, 400, 450 people a service. You know, your service at night would start at 6 and last orders are at 12, so you're doing a six-hour straight cooking, you know, uh, service. Um, so they were, you know, but you worked hard and you played hard as well. And, and in London at that time was probably one of the most exciting places to be in terms of cuisine. So, yeah, I look back on that and it's amazing. I'm, I'm pretty... I'm pretty uh, pretty grateful for the opportunities I've had I've you know I've been uh, you know cooked at 10 Downing Street met the Queen um, uh, and uh, you know cooked for uh, G20 people Barack Obama so what did you cook for Barack Obama Oh, we did. I cooked for the G20 and um, we did a, a buffet. <laughs> Wouldn't be doing that now. Um, <laughs> um, it was like uh, I did um, like a, a barbecue, so um, a big barbecue, and we did a Flinders Island lamb. And um, I wanted to do some um, Wagyu beef, but um, they were having Wagyu at Goma, so Josh got to do that. And I ended up cooking with Flinders Island lamb, which was fantastic, and used a lot of Queensland seafood, uh, Morton Bay or... Um, Morton Bay oysters, bugs, beautiful Malula bar prawns, and just laid it on. And old uh, Mr. Obama, POTUS, POTUS came back for seconds, which was, uh, uh, you know, quite a good compliment. I remember when it happened because he got up and everyone just went into fucking panic mode. You know, the the you know, president of the United States is moving. And uh, afterwards, the, um, the organizers had said to us, you know, they're all on comms going, POTUS is on the move, POTUS is on the move. And um, <laughs> and he just got up and came up to the buffet and he goes, I worked out this morning and, uh, you know, I think I can have some more. And he had some more lamb and, and uh, you know, whatnot. And, uh, yeah, fully enjoyed it. That's pretty amazing. And, you know, Brisbane's become really amazing. I know you've been an integral part of, you know, the development of the culinary landscape there. But, you know, can you give, paint a picture of, you know, what you've seen develop in the last couple of years? I mean, it's been a really vibrant hub of food. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's come on leaps and bounds. I moved here in 2008 and I opened my first restaurant here in um, 2010 down at South Bank overlooking the big swimming pools and it was like, you know, a come all kind of place. It was called Surf Club and, um, you know, we focus on seafood and, and a really good bar. And um, I think Matt Moran had just moved up around that time in 2010 with Aria. Um, and so that was really when it started to sort of like grab some legs and, and start to go. You had Ortega, uh, which was a great restaurant. And then Ryan opened um, um, his restaurant and, uh, you know, he was one best restaurant in Australia. I was definitely a first Brisbane's first three uh, first three hat restaurant. Um, and then you know you start to see. I, I think the the thing about what was attractive about Brisbane was you had like a a really sort of hungry population that wanted sort of quality and variety and and um, and then operators from uh, Sydney and Melbourne started to move up here. You know um, you had the Fink Group with uh, Otto and and um, a number of other operators move up here and and and, um, and the market was ready for it and it's it's been great you know and with the advent of uh howard smith wharves as, as a precinct uh you know alana opening up there and um doing really well sadly you know i think they might have been victim of this sort of indirectly the covid sort of crisis but um yeah but i think we're at a point now where we're all, that we still need another million people in Brisbane to make it really work for us, you know. Um, places still close at sort of uh, 9 o'clock because you don't get many more um, or last orders at night because you don't really get many more people coming to your restaurant after that. They're all tucked up at home in bed or on their deck, you know, drinking uh, Pinot with ice cubes in it. The weather's too good up there, is it? 
Yeah, mate, it was beautiful today. It's <laughs> it's always good. It, it gets a bit hot in summer, but it, yeah, it's uh, it's perfect for um, drinking weather, majoritively. What's it been like in Brisbane during this period, and you know how have operators there dealt with this situation? You know, how do you? What's the sense there? Um, uh, I think there's a lot of frustration. There was a lot of panic to begin with. Some places I know that, um, just closed and um, didn't pay uh, any entitlements, which they probably could have. I think a lot, a lot of people reacted differently. Some, you know, some of the good people really looked after their staff, and some just shut down and said, "Tough titties. We're just going to sort of like see if we can bunker down and get through this." Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of pain for a lot of people in terms of employees. Uh, a lot of frustration, a lot of panic from uh, from people like myself, operators, small business operators, um, you know, seeing their revenues go from 100% to like 5%, uh, some like myself sitting happily in the middle um, and um, really not sort of knowing what was going to happen. And then JobKeeper was announced and, you know, that was – such a clusterfuck in the way that was um, implemented, and how who was a who was a uh, you know eligible for it, how to apply, when it was going to get paid, and a lot of people decided not to even go for it because you know you had to front up you know, at least a month's worth of salary, so we had to pay twenty five thousand dollars straight up to pay all our people uh, and wait for that money to come back. And some people don't didn't have that kind of, uh, you know, um, residual cash. And then, you know, um, the frustration of who was included. So all of a sudden you've got a, a casual person that's been doing 10 hours, but he's been with you or she's been with you for a year and all of a sudden they're getting 750. But you've got full-time staff that were on salaries that, you know, actually I have to take a haircut. And so there was a lot of inequity, and the saddest thing was, all was I, I have a quite a few kitchen hands and um, and um, casuals that are on student visas and uh, and not full time visas uh, or, or residency visas that just got completely shut out, and they pay taxes and they do everything else that everyone else does. But you know, I get texts from like. Um, Rahan, he goes, Chef, have you got any work? I've got no money. I can't pay my rent. I'm like, mate, <laughs> I can't do anything for you. Just come down and get some food or, um, you know, we're kind of, you know, my hands are tied. Has this experience made you rethink uh, the industry and restaurants moving forward? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, uh, one thing I hope is that like, in terms of employees, will remember the people that, um, did the right thing and when they return to the industry we'll seek out those people that are uh, conscientious and, and, and want to look after them and, and um, think about the welfare of their employees and figure about these groups that have um, left them high and dry so really think about the people that have stuck their necks out and sort of done their best. Um, I think um, a lot of our sort of models will need to change. We're definitely going to change our model here at Annerley. We're going to go to um, a no service model, order at the counter. Um, we'll probably have one runner taking stuff out um, because we've seen it. Like just before JobKeeper came in, you know, we stood down all our um, casuals um, that, uh, and we kept um, all our sort of full time, part time staff. And um, and our, our wage costs went from 40% down to um, 12 and a half. Well, front of house went from 18% down to 12. Kitchen stood about the same at about 30. But, you know, from a turnover of 16000 we were actually making $1,000 profit. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and we don't know what our revenues are going to return to. They'll probably stay the same. They might creep up a little bit, but we can't we can't afford to carry the payroll we used to so we just have to change our service model west end again you know um we'll have to see how that sort of all pans out and but it's going to result in less people working in our businesses there's no doubt about it you know and i think you know no more no more annualized salaries we're going to switch to sort of like this hourly rates uh on a 38 hour week so there'll be benefits for people in terms of them getting probably a work-life balance but there'll be kind of like a significant reduction in actual salaries, I think. You know, that's the reality of it. you got mates all around the world in the restaurant game. You know, what have you heard from them about the impacts of the virus? Oh, it's been brutal. I, I mean, I look at 
you know, speaking to Curtis, um, and uh, you know, uh, they just shut. And there's, you know, he's um, doing everything he can to keep his guys um, in work, keep revenues through. You know, I mean. The whole employment structure over there is completely different to here. At least there's some sort of safety and it's there. There's nothing, you know. And a lot of his guys work from check to check, uh, or paycheck to paycheck. And so, I mean, he's just frantic trying to keep people um, employed, keep cash coming into the business, you know, doing the marketplaces, take away the butcher shops going, you know, um, and he's doing a good job. But it's just hard, you know. It's just you're flat out just treading water people in the uk that's even worse you know they would just shut down nothing no no you know not even takeaway for its a time being you know um and um it's just phenomenal the way it's kind of like this dominoed through our industry yeah what's some of the positives to come from this for you <laughs> um I, for me personally um just having some nights off you know obviously we don't only do days now and and um, just to keep sort of all our hours down and, and keep everyone fresh. And so having a bit of personal time has been great. Sort of being home with the, with the kids in the, in the evenings has been wonderful. Um, also having a bit more time to connect with our, uh, with our um, customers, you know, me being able to step out the front and, and sort of having conversations and meeting people as opposed to it mainly being sort of my wife sort of with that personal connection with everyone so that's been really good but uh and having the time to actually reach out and um talk to my uh sort of peers you know um and um understand what they're going through and sort of um you know get some uh feedback on the decisions and choices they've made um and, you know to sort of help sort of solidify your own ideas and perceptions of what you need to do what's worked for them what hasn't what's working for you so you know that connection with with people because before that it was just like head down concentrate on your own business and it was almost and, and there's less competitive uh, you know less competition like rivalry i think um you know now we need to work collectively the choices we need to make as a as an industry like putting our prices up and not being price competitive you know, trying to win business from other people, it's, it's this got to change. Um, what else? So, yeah, that's personally from a point, that point of view, I think it's like, from, and especially for my team, it's them being able to reconnect with their families and having a little bit more time, you know, nights off. It's actually been quite nice. Well, mate, um, is a new TV series back on the go and um, is it something we can look forward to soon? Well, it's on now. Yeah, it's on. It's kind of it's it's kind of weird. It's on. I I haven't actually seen any of it because I'm like normally working in the afternoon. It's on Channel Ten. It's a bit of fun. It's my market kitchen. I kind of took over hosting it. But previously, they had sort of like ex Master Chef alumni, and um, I don't think it was really working for them. And um, so I got the opportunity. And I love I love doing that kind of side of the business because one thing. I suppose it comes back to what I wanted to be as a, a, a as a young student, being a, a teacher. It kind of um, you know puts me in that, that uh, position again, being able to communicate sort of my passion for food, um, and um, and I, and I do it. It's not stressful. It's not like working in a restaurant where you've got so many other pressures external from what you're actually doing on the pans. You know the, the business, the HR. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and doing something like that really sort of. Um, Reimbibes me with that sort of passion for the um, for for the industry. You know, um, being a small business operator can, you know, it can be so painful at times, but um, so rewarding. But you know, more often than not, it's just stressful. <laughs> so doing that has been uh, been sort of like you know a, a breath of breath of fresh air. It's a, you know, it's not like I love doing it. It's not my ideal job. Something like uh, serving the menu. That was like the the got you know the you know the 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 sort of gold standard tv <laughs> job that was awesome uh, <laughs> doesn't get better than that but uh um yeah it, it's it's been great so you know um it's on and it's on for it we did 90 episodes so it's on for quite a while you can catch it's fun it's pretty loose uh, um, and I've still got one more week to do. We got shut down and I uh, had one more week of filming. So we're in talks now about how to get me down to Melbourne. Well, we're just on that, you know, 
there's no real sign that the Queensland borders are going to reopen. You know, uh, no. What sort of impact do you think that's going to have moving forward? Oh, massive. Well, I've got a, a, a girlfriend of my wife's. They went to university together. She's a, a GM for a core up in Cairns. And they are absolutely, you know, they've been decimated up there in the far north. I mean, all of their business revolves around tourism dollar. Uh, they're sitting at 1% occupancy, you know. Um, the amount of staff they had to stand down, it's just, it's brutal. Um, and it should be open. I mean, we should be able to, you know, move. Everyone should be responsible for their own sort of like um, actions in terms of hygiene and being conscious of everyone else and, you know, being considerate and, you know, um, you know sort of distancing yourself to a degree. But and I don't think it has to be this draconian. She just, uh, she's just trying to pr- be tough. And, and it's just being stupid because there's so many businesses being affected, you know. So when you sort of finally opened up and, you know, the restaurants, you know, back to relatively normality, um, how's it going to feel? <laughs> oh, I think uh, hopefully um, uh, good, good. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, well, <laughs> we just want to take a holiday. Me and my wife were um, thinking, uh, you know, we should have shut down at the beginning of this and uh, and had a bit of a break a lot of you know and it seemed that a lot of people around us were really enjoying the fact that they were were not at work and they were doing jobs around the house you know and all this sort of stuff getting fit and walking every afternoon it was like great it was almost like living back in the 70s when you're a child because all the kids are riding their bikes up and down the street and everyone's talking to their neighbors over the fence and blah 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 um so um, I think when everything goes back to normal, we're going to shut and take a holiday. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't know where that is. That'll probably be, you know, somewhere on the coast so I can go for a good surf. My wife can read a couple of books and, uh, you know, have a fish or something. That's, um, but hopefully, like, business will be good. Business will be um, – people will be um, very supportive and understanding of um, – you know the price increases that we probably need to put in put in there, um, um, but I, you know I think we're uh, we're still in for a bit of a rocky road, and I don't know how long that road's going to be be rocky for, but hopefully not too long. You know, absolutely, mate. Um, always good to chat, and hopefully next time it's over a beer again. Maybe not as many as last time. Um, <laughs> <but> <laughs> really appreciate your time, mate. Keep in touch, and and thanks for for being on the show. Thanks, mate. Thanks, hang in there. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.